A few months ago, this channel put out a leak that confirmed Beast Lake, which was part of Jim Keller's Royal Corps project to regain x86 leadership from AMD, was cancelled. At the time, I was basically told that this was likely due to the project running into some issues, issues that were becoming expensive, and therefore, Pat cancelled Jim Keller's baby. But then, over the course of the following month, I had some existing and even some new sources reach out to me in order to clarify the situation after seeing all of the stuff that I had said in that video. And these people that I spoke with face-to-face, -face, by the way, and gave me proof of their employment, painted a very different picture. It was a story of accomplishment and then sudden cancellation. Supposedly, the team working on Royal Corps was hitting milestone after milestone, and while no project is perfect, everyone I spoke with eventually agreed that the largest reason Royal Corps was canceled wasn't because they wouldn't eventually accomplish what they were trying to accomplish, it was for political reasons, and then also a desire to put more money aside for AI projects instead of Intel's core business of CPU. And this was very saddening to me because the sources provided me with a rough architecture roadmap that suggested the Royal Core project was leading towards an incredible and revolutionary new concept of how a high-performance CPU core could work by transforming between six insanely high IPC mega big cores into 24 high throughput cores on the fly whenever it needed to, depending on what apps you were running. And guess what? Yeah, since that video, more people have reached out to me again, and some of them wanted to ensure that I hear the other side of the story and maybe get a more optimistic picture of what's coming out instead of Royal Core. Uh, that maybe Royal Core was canceled for reasonable reasons, and that what's coming out instead in Coyote and Griffin Cove is actually going to be plenty competitive with AMD if it turns out well. But first, yeah, I actually want to touch on Battle Mage. I, of course, saw the announcement that Intel will be doing a client graphics update at the end of this month, and after hinting that I would do some sort of Battle Mage update heavily in recent content, I'm finally deciding today that I should talk about what I've been hearing about Battle Mage. And so, here you go. Let's not waste any time. Let me put this on screen. So, what you're looking at here is what the final Battle Mage dies that haven't been canceled should be. And I want to stress this. There was at least one other die above G31 that was a lot stronger but canceled due to cost and performance issues. And actually, even G31, I'm told, is basically the second version of it. It just didn't work. And that's a major reason why Battle Mage is coming out so late. But yeah, G31, 32 XE cores for those keeping track. That's the same amount of cores as Alchemist had, and 256 bit is also the same memory bus width that Alchemist had with the A770. 20 gig gigabit per second GDR6. I did hear briefly, you know, a while ago that maybe they considered GDR6X, but on all roadmaps that were shared with me in the past week, GDDR6, apparently. Uh, but it will PCIe 5.0, DisplayPort 2.1, and it's going to perform around an RTX 4070, I guess. I don't really see this as a competitive product, and the same goes with G21, which is 20 XE cores, 192-bit. I don't personally, I'm sure someone does, you know, out there, but I don't personally know the RAM speed they're going with for it. But still PCIe 5.0, DisplayPort 2.1, and then RX 7600 XT performance, or maybe a bit better, I've been told. No, that doesn't that doesn't really impress me very much. And I am told that Laptop Battle Mage remains entirely canceled, but there will at least therefore be a limited edition launch of at least two desktop SKUs because Intel has bought up this capacity from TSMC and they've got to get rid of it somewhere, but it's going to be as low volume as they can get away with based on their contracts with TSMC. And again, not even in Laptop. Uh, Biostar is mentioned as a potential AIB, but besides that, overall AIB support is expected to be terrible, with almost zero desire to gamble on ARC again. Additionally, a source I spoke with specifically mentioned to me that AMD is going out of their way to offer good Ryzen plus RDNA 4 bundles ahead of time to AIBs, like they're already, even though RDNA 4 isn't coming out in the next month. They're already going to them and saying, this is what it's going to be. This is what it's going to cost. And if you, you know, order this with 9800X3Ds X3Ds or whatever, or, you know, or use this in laptop with Strix or something, uh, we will give you a really good deal. And already, that's another thing making AIBs go. We're not sure why we would bother with Battle Mage any more than we have to. When RDNA 4 is going to be so much better easier to sell, a better brand, and allow us to get discounts on other AMD products we actually want. Uh, and then finally, Battle Mage is expected to have far more consistent performance, to be fair, like, you know, higher IPC, 
uh, per core. Actually, maybe a lot higher IPC per core uh, with Battle Mage XE cores versus what Alchemist had per XE core. But in addition to that, far less situations where the performance just falls apart. Like, that was the problem with the A770s. Every now and then it would perform like a 3060 Ti. And then every now and then it would perform, kid you not, I tested it. And I still do test it and it still does this in some games to this day. It would perform like an RTX 3050. That variance of performance between 3050 to 3060 Ti was just ridiculous. Apparently, Battle Mage will have far less scenarios where like just specific games fall completely apart in performance. However, there's not much optimism behind it at Intel, since it will be forced to be launched on a shoestring budget, meaning they can't afford to subsidize the cost as much this time. And it's going to be uncompetitive with RDNA 4 while not having as much of a pricing advantage that they had before. And unless it sells incredibly well, I'm directly told that there's like a single DGPU configuration of Celestial remaining. If Battle Mage doesn't sell well, they're axing that and just leaving it as a tile-only architecture. And so, you know, actually, before we move on, let me remind you of what I actually said in that art cancellation leak a couple of years ago. The way I would put it is what most people have been expecting, this roadmap of enthusiasts through low-end cards, multiple dies, eventually multi-die configurations for the enthusiast. It, it's not going to happen. Or if it's like an, like a below 1% chance that the decision's been made and ARC is not long for this world anymore, at least not in a way that would make anybody excited. And if you look around, Raja all of a sudden is talking about data center, not gaming. And I made it clear in that other art cancellation video that I don't believe AXG is going to be completely killed off and they're going to keep making professional and data center accelerator products and they're going to keep making data center stuff but what you wanted out of AXG if you're watching this knowing my fans probably you wanted big lineups of gaming graphics cards at least the way we've been dreaming of it it's gone you see, I played that because a lot of people misquote what I said in that ARC effectively, underline that word, effectively canceled leak. I didn't say that the A770 wouldn't launch. I said it would launch. And I said Alchemist would just have a terrible life cycle and then Battle Mage would have some sort of dedicated GPU launch. But that because the ARC cancellation decision was made, well, so many things were already very far into development that... You know, you'll see something come out, but it's not going to be that impressive. And that's probably going to be a whimper that leads to eventually less and less products each generation existing until, well, until ARC becomes tile only. And that is pretty much what I think is going on here. And I guess just some closing thoughts on what I just leaked about Battle Mage is I just want to drill down on why I don't think it'll be very competitive with RDNA 4 one more time. Navi 48, the flagship die for RDNA 4, is going to be at least 30% faster than G31. And yet almost certainly have a smaller and therefore cheaper to manufacture die. So much stronger, much cheaper, and Intel is out of money. They can't afford to subsidize it as much. I just don't think it's going to look competitive at all. And again, it wouldn't surprise me if there were only a couple AIBs that supported it, and Battle Mage was portrayed almost just as a limited edition collector's item launch intentionally this time around. And then, I mean, G21, that one's even worse. It's a 192-bit 4 nanometer die that's best hope is beating AMD's old 6 nanometer 128-bit budget die. And remember, the 7600 XT isn't what G21 is going to have to compete with. It's going to be competing with AMD's next-gen RDNA 4 Navi 44 die that is going to be really small and stronger than the 7600 XT. Wholly uncompetitive. And so, look, I guess I will say this to be fair for Battle Mage. If Intel pulls a rabbit out of a hat with it and it ends up at the upper end of projected performance, like let's say it actually ends up around a 4070 Ti, uh, you know, instead of a 4070, and then RDNA 4 also falls flat, like let's say that actually ends up like a 7900 GRE, yeah, I think you should go out and support ARC in large numbers because this would be the chance to tell Intel, hey, you actually made a good product this time and we're going to reward you, and then ARC might be uncanceled or whatever. But if it isn't competitive... Don't just go out and blindly buy it, because I don't think we should encourage Intel to pour more money into this fire pit when they could be using it to launch other products that sound far, far more competitive, like Coyote and Griffin Cove, which I now want to leak those products that I'm actually getting a little excited about to you. But first, an ad from a sponsor. 
This piece of content is brought to you by Notion and their new Notion AI. Notion AI has the capabilities of an AI chatbot, writing assistant, and universal search all in one, and most importantly, it's built into your workspace already. And because of that, it saves you time and cost. For example, you can use Notion AI to connect your Slack and Google Drive to easily access information from both platforms without leaving your Notion workspace. And, or you can also use it to revise podcast scripts, you know, I do podcasting, uh, to be rewritten in a different voice or kind of actually act like a content prep buddy before you start recording a new episode. That's what I tried to use it for, and it worked pretty well. I'm really not kidding on that, actually, because before recording with Hardware Unboxed recently, I uploaded my broken silicon discussion document to Notion and then started asking it questions. Uh, like, for example, I asked it, what do you think this conversation will mostly be about? And Notion AI correctly summarized the talking points me and Steve from Hardware Unbox would go through. Or to brace myself for the comments section, I actually also asked Notion AI for an anonymous Intel engineer episode of Broken Silicon. What subjects we were planning to discuss are likely to have a lot of controversy, a lot of emotional responses in the comments linked to them. And <laughs> for this one, it actually said pretty much everything. Anything having to do with Arrow Lake performance or how Zen 5 is turning out versus Granite, Rapids, and Server, people are likely to have strong feelings for. That's really useful to me to take what I plan to talk about and ask Notion, you know, what should I be worried about and what are people talking about regarding these subjects already? Because it, it can just do it. It's like a content prep buddy. And I think it'd be really useful for you too for doing all different sorts of things. So anyways, I want to thank Notion for sponsoring this video. Please scan the QR code on screen or visit the link in the description to sign up for Notion AI today for just $10. And remember that doing so, even just clicking on that link in the description or scanning that QR code, that helps the channel a ton. So support Moore's Law is Dead by checking out Notion and their new Notion AI today. All right, now once again, let's not waste any time. I'm not going to bother to go into core counts and all the various configurations because that's not really the focus of this video. It's just leaking and confirming code names and telling you the direction Intel's architectures are going into. So this is more about the architecture, the IPC, and less about exact gigahertz and core counts of these upcoming products. But yeah, I mean, like, for example, Panther Lake S, if it comes to desktop, that should be 8 big cores, 16 little cores. So for most of these, you can probably guess what their core counts are. Anyways, though, moving on. Yep, so I've already leaked, and I'm just putting it up here again, that next year Intel should be launching Panther Lake, uh, it definitely to laptop as we know, in fact they just showed it off publicly, but that it also might come to desktop as 8 plus 16 core configuration instead of Arrow Lake refresh, and it will be on the 18A node, it will use Cougar Co. P cores, which this channel exclusively leaked years ago by the way, and it should get a 5-13% to IPC increase for those P cores. And you know, I, most people advise me it's on the lower end of that estimate, so it's more like around 5%, but I can't discount what some sources are saying. It might really uh, succeed in, and some apps really well. It just depends on the proportions. Let's just leave it at 5 to 13%. And then there will be Dark Mont e cores as well. Now, after that, there should be the launch of Nova Lake. That will launch with 18A. Uh, P. So that's plus an enhanced version of the 18A node using Coyote Cove P cores. And here's actually a funny story for you. I was told that it did have something called Panther Cove. So like Cougar Cove went into Panther Lake, but then they kept developing Panther Cove and that was expected to maybe go into Nova Lake. But there was also like a variant of the architecture called Coyote Cove, and they're kind of just like merging these variants of the same architecture and choosing to go with the Coyote Cove name because they think it would sound really weird if Panther Lake had Cougar Cove and Nova Lake had Panther Cove. So they're going with Coyote Cove, but that's let's get back to it here. This one's expected to get a higher IPC increase than Panther Lake. I mean, probably around double whatever Panther Lake uh, ends up achieving. So, you know, Panther Lake gets to like 5%. Expect 10% or better for Nova Lake, but some people think that it could get a bit above 15%. Uh, and then it gets Arctic Wolf e cores. Again, this channel exclusively leaked Arctic Wolf as well. And then this is where we get into the really interesting part here. So then we get into Griffin Cove p cores i don't have the name of the lake for this i don't even know if it's decided yet but i have been told it uses an enhanced version of the 14a intel node it's expected to get another decent size ipc uplift it is quite far away though so it's a large range 10 to 20 percent uh and i can't confirm what e cores it will get and this is where it gets even more interesting because i am told directly that 
after Griffin Cove, there shouldn't be E-Cores anymore, at least not in the way it's going now, where there's two entirely different architectures. The way it's been described to me is that it will actually be somewhat close to how you can think about like Zen 5 and Zen 5C, and the fact that there are actually multiple versions of Zen 5C. There's a 4 nanometer variant uh, in Strix Point, and then there's a more server-optimized 3 nanometer variant in Turin. That's kind of what it sounds like Intel's going to do, except they may go a step further and then just the variants of their cores might remove some instruction sets and some libraries for more space speed or whatever right so it's kind of closer to what amd is doing right now and they're just done with e cores which i am very excited about but again just being clear about this i haven't been told an e core for griffin cove and some of my sources think that griffin cove might actually be the first architecture to stop using e cores so i can't be 100 percent sure it's griffin cove but i can tell you that after griffin cove Intel should be done with E-Cores. Uh, and additionally, after Griffin Cove, the unified core that comes after it should get some of the royal core features that Beast Lake was hoping to get. I don't know which ones. I, I'm not sure if they're still going to give it another crack at rentable units, but it sounds like some of the efficiency and boosting things they were working on for Beast Lake might get into Griffin Cove next. And then, uh, yeah, I have also been told in general that everything after Noble Lake is not finalized. And that's another reason I'm not going to bother talking about the core counts yet because of how much is changing. And also that Cobra Core, I saw this appear in headlines a while back, uh, or I guess recently I should say that there's something called Cobra Core. That's not going to come out. Cobra Core is apparently what I was told Royal Core 2.0 is. It was part of the Jim Keller project. That's not coming out, guys. Griffin Cove is the one that is. And what do I think about all of this? Well, I think this looks pretty damn good, actually, if this turns out to be true. I mean, I'm hearing that Zen 6 is going to get at least a 10% IPC increase in an entirely new memory controller. But so, what's the best case scenario on Zen 6 IPC? Probably 15%, certainly lower than 20%. And it seems like Panther Lake might be able to tread water with Zen 6, maybe. And then before Zen 7 is out, Nova Lake looks like he'll just win. And then after that, Griffin Cove, I'm told, should launch after Zen 7, but be very, very competitive with it. And, of course, it's Intel, so we'll have to see if this goes badly here. But this is making me feel a little bit better after leaking that Royal Core was canceled. But, I mean, I much prefer some sort of hyper big cores that double IPC. But if Intel's managing to up IPC by, you know, 5 to 15% every year and a half that to me sounds like they'll still tread water with AMD to a certain degree. Again, if they actually accomplish these things, it is Intel. They've failed before. But if they manage to do that, that tells me that there will still be competition. And I'm especially excited to hear that indeed, it's not just the Royal Core team that wanted to get rid of E-Cores. They're still planning to do that. And that makes me much more optimistic that Intel's cores may be headed in the right direction again, finally. All right, well, that is going to do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, please remember to comment below for the algorithm, to like the video, to share it. That helps the channel so much. And then, of course, to subscribe to Moore's Law is Dead on YouTube. That helps so much with how much we get recommended as we grow into the types of guests I can get on the channel. Please, as about half of you aren't subscribed to the channel, please double check that you are and ring that bell button. Then, of course, also consider supporting us on Patreon. You'll get access to early ad-free versions of Broken Silicon, a Discord to discuss this content with me and thousands of other fans. You also get access to a catalog of hundreds of bonus pieces of content that have no ads and are only ever found there on the Patreon. A new dye drink just came out, and you can access it right now for just $2. So please consider doing that. That's really the best way to show support for the channel is the Patreon. But, you know, no matter what, if you made it this far in the video, thank you for watching. <laughs>